This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MD Edge Hematology slash Oncology, where we discuss the latest research, treatment considerations, and other issues related to hematology and oncology. Welcome to this podcast. I'm your host, Dr. David Henry, and this week we're doing part two with my friend and colleague down the hall, Dr. David Mincer, who is clinical professor of medicine. He's our division chief of hematology oncology in the Department of Medicine at Pennsylvania Hospital. Dave, welcome again for, for doing this uh, part two of what happened last year or recent FDA approvals. Thanks, David. I'm happy to be back. So take it away. I hear there's only just a few. Right. So uh, as we had discussed last time, there's this continuing deluge of newer drugs, which is certainly very exciting. Um, for physicians and even more so for patients in our field. So I picked out some of the newer drugs that have been FDA approved over about the past eight months. We're not gonna be able to touch on every one, but I selected some highlights that we'll mention um, for the sake of time uh, relatively briefly. So the first is a monoclonal antibody for HER2 uh, positive breast cancer called uh, Margituximab, brand name is uh, Margenza. This was FDA approved for metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer for patients who have received two or more previous anti-HER2 regimens, at least one of which was for metastatic disease. So it's another type of uh, Herceptin molecule or Trastuzumab molecule. The antibody, the FAB fragment binds uh, and is the same as Trastuzumab binding to the HER2, but the FC portion of the antibody has been genetically engineered to increase the affinity um, for um, certain receptors to enhance antibody-dependent cell-mediated uh, antibody cell cytotoxicity. So hopefully this will be basically a more potent type of trastuzumab. Um, this was evaluated in the SOFIA trial, which was a randomized multi-center uh, trial with 536 patients with HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. And the patients were randomized to receive uh, kind of a chemotherapy of dealer's choice with either trastuzumab or the margituximab. Uh, what they found in that study was that progression-free survival was modestly better with the margituximab arm of 5.8 months versus 4.9 months in the trastuzumab control arm. Response rate was 22% um, in the margituximab arm versus 16%. Uh, the duration of response was about six months. There's an interim overall survival analysis, which actually does show a couple of months of benefit. 21.6 months versus 19.8 months, but we don't have the overall or final survival data yet. There are a little bit more uh, infusion reactions to the margituximab. Uh, you know, where we're going to use this is unclear. Obviously, HER2 positive breast cancer has seen an expansion of therapeutics from, of course, trastuzumab to pertuzumab to lapatinib, then neratinib, and now to catinib, and the um, trastuzumab directs a TCAN, the NHER2 as well as uh, TDM1. Uh, so whether this is gonna be a fifth or six line therapy is kind of unclear, but it may provide some additional benefit. So for this trial, you had to have two or more previous HER2 positive therapies, and then you got either straight trastuzumab or this better antibody dependent. But so it's not up front, because I think of this as maybe an upfront molecule and the more exciting ones down the line, but this is for after two. Right, we'll see if it moves up the line. Um, okay. And it was used with choice of either capecitabine, aribulin, gemcitabine, or venerelbi. So uh, it's just when you're when you're coming down the road, you could probably uh, use this as an alternative to trastuzumab. Okay. Another monoclonal antibody recently FDA approved, this time for relapse diffuse uh, large B cell lymphoma, is um, tefacitamib. Um, brand name is Monjuvi. So this is a CD19 directed cytolytic antibody um, that was given in combination with lenalidomide for patients with relapsed or refractory large B cell lymphoma, uh, including transformed lymphomas arising from low grade lymphoma in patients ineligible for auto transplant. This was an open label multi center trial, 81 patients. The patients received the tefacitamab. Um, in combination with lenalidomide, 25 milligrams, three weeks on, one week off, for a maximum of 12 cycles, followed by just maintenance of the antibody. The overall response rate was pretty impressive. Um, in 71 patients with the relapsed large cell lymphoma, there was a 55% um, 
response rate, a 37% complete response rate in a group of uh, patients with refractory disease with a median duration of response of 21.7 months. The antibody was pretty well tolerated. Um, there are some cytopenias, which may also be related to the lenalidomide. I mean, it is a lot of visits. So the first month you get uh, five infusions, the second month you get four infusions. Following that, you continue on infusions twice a month. Exactly the, where this will fall in the use in, in the treatment of um, relapsing large cell lymphoma is unclear because we obviously have a variety of CAR T cell products on the market. We had Selinexor we've discussed in one of our previous sessions approved. Uh, and we also have the polituzumab Bidot and the Polyvy in combination with bendamustin and um, uh, rituxin as well. But yet it's another, another um, option for relapsed large cell lymphoma in an expanding armamentarium. Exactly, and this is approved just uh, recently as well. Right, all these again in the past eight months really quite remarkable. The next drug on the hit parade here is Lurbanectidin. Uh, brand name is Zepselka. This is for patients with metastatic small cell lung cancer with progression on or after platinum-based chemotherapy. So we obviously haven't had a new drug in terms of chemotherapeutic agents for small cell cancer in a long time. We now have immunotherapy that can be utilized as part of initial therapy for extensive stage disease as well as in relapse disease. Um, this drug, this lerbinectum, is an alkylating agent that inhibits transcription. Um, and um, this was a study that looked at 105 patients. They got 3.2 milligrams per meter squared. It's an IV infusion every 21 days. The overall response rate in this group of refractory or relapsed small cell lung cancer was 35% with a median duration of response of 5.3 months. Uh, it does cause significant myelosuppression, uh, some renal insufficiency and LFT abnormalities. But again, um, a, a drug uh, in a new class really that we haven't dealt with for small cell lung cancer. There are studies ongoing to use this in combination with perhaps arena tecan or other agents, and I'm sure also attempting to move it up front. But right now the approval is single agent relapsed refractory small cell lung cancer. Interesting, okay. Okay, next uh, again, uh, a new agent is uh, Belantamab Mafadotin, which is uh, Blenrep is the brand name. This is for patients with refrapsed or refractory multiple myeloma who have received at least four prior therapies, including an anti-CD38, a proteasome inhibitor, and an IMID. Um, so this is one of the uh, newest therapies for myeloma targeting BCMA, a popular target now, the B-cell maturation antigen, which is expressed on all plasma cells and essentially all myeloma cells, but restricted to those cells. Um, this antibody is uh, against the BCMA antigen and it's conjugated with a microtubular inhibitor or a statin F, toxic moiety. And as with many of these immunoconjugants, what happens of course is that the antibody seeks out the plasma cell and then uh, the uh, toxic moiety is incorporated into the cell and causes cytotoxicity. Uh, there are other BMCA um, targeted therapies, which include CAR T cells now directed against BMCA, as well as the bite cells, the bispecific T cell engagers. Um, but this drug is already on the market. There is a black box warning. Um, you need to complete a REMS program to use it, mostly because of the ocular toxicity. So we have to be very vigilant that these patients get um, corneal epithelial ulcerations, changes in vision. They have to see an ophthalmologist or optometrist at baseline and then prior to each and every dose um, of this drug. But um, it is another um, drug for myeloma that was studied in the DREAM2 study, uh, where it was given intravenously once every three weeks at 3.4 milligrams per kilogram. The overall response rate was 31% in these uh, refractory myeloma patients. 73% of responders had response durations of over six months. So the BMCA targets are um, exciting, and this is the first agent to really come to market for that, but I'm sure others will follow. And the REM sign out, uh, thinking back to the ESA days, so you probably go to the company webpage or Google it and find that and sign up. It was, say again, how often that, we have to watch for it, but is that high, low, how frequent the ocular toxicity? So you have to actually have them get a ophthalmologic exam, a slit lamp exam and acuity checkup before every single dose. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yes, and you can do the REMS online. It wasn't too painful. Uh, so the physician has to sign up for it. And also the treating center has to um, complete the REMS as well. Okay. The next drug is uh, Umbralicid, which is a uh, brand name Uconic, which is a, a uh, PI3 kinase uh, delta inhibitor. And it was recently FDA approved for refractory marginal zone lymphoma as well as refractory follicular lymphoma. So there are a number of these drugs on the market. So we had, of course, for a long time now, Adelalisib, which was approved for CLL and small lymphocytic lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, has significant GI toxicity with diarrhea and hepatotoxicity. Then we had Duvalesib approved for CLL and SLL, um, another oral um, PI3 kinase inhibitor. Then we had Copanalisib, which was a, is an IV formulation approved for follicular lymphoma. And now, we have umbralicid, which is the newest one, uh, which also has the approval not only for follicular lymphoma, but for marginal zone lymphoma. You know, where this will fall um, in utilization compared to the other PI3 kinase inhibitors is unclear. This might be a little bit less toxic and more active. I don't think we have head-to-head -head trials. Um, for marginal zone lymphoma, results showed an overall response rate of 49% with a 16% complete response rate. Um, and for patients with follicular lymphoma, the overall response rate was 43% um, with 3% complete response rate. You can get some diarrhea, some transaminitis, some renal insufficiency, um, but this has been a pretty well-tolerated drug. One of our partners uh, has been participating in the UNITY trials, uh, Dr. Beach, who works with Dave and I, um, and is pretty impressed with this drug. It's 800 milligrams uh, once a day. Um, until disease progression or unacceptable toxicity. And that tip for the study, you had to fail some others first, or you could, this, where does this- Yes, these were therapy? previously treated patients with relapsed or refractory um, marginal zone or follicular lymphoma. Um, for the marginal zone, they had to have failed at least one prior anti-CD20 regimen. And for the follicular lymphomas, they had to fail at least three prior lines of systemic therapy. So the follicular lymphoma patients were, were pretty heavily pretreated. Okay. All right, if you're hanging in there. Um, next, uh, some acute leukemia updates. So one is the azacitidine tablets, which is Onureg is the brand name. Azacitidine, uh, of course, has been utilized for acute leukemia as well as myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, this oral formulation, these azacitidine tablets were recently FDA approved based on the Quasar study, which was a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in uh, 472 patients with acute myelogenous leukemia who had achieved remission um, and were then randomized to receive this drug or placebo. The drug is taken orally uh, for two weeks on and then two weeks off. Um, this uh, led to an improvement in overall survival, which was pretty dramatic. Median overall survival was 24.7 months in the uh, treated arm versus 14.8 months in the placebo arm. You know, previous studies looking at intravenous azacitidine, the more typical formulation had been equivocal or not really positive in improving overall survival. But this oral formulation um, uh, really seemed to hit the mark. It's uh, important to point out this is not bioequivalent. You can't use the same doses or the same way as the intravenous or injectable azacitidine that we're used to using. Uh, this study, I should point out, was for only patients over 55 who are not transplant candidates. Where this will fit is unclear. This study was, you know, uh, run from 2013 to 2017. Um, so this was before sort of venetoclax and azacitidine combinations came into widespread use, before the FLIP3 and IDH1 and IDH2 inhibitors. Um, so this just looked at this broad group of older patients who were not transplant eligible who had achieved remission. But certainly, uh, it is an option that is now available to us. So as you're thinking, you get induction, and then in the old days, induction, consolidation, maintenance. So this would be induction, and then directly to this oral maintenance. Right. Good point. Although in the study, some of the patients had received consolidation and some didn't. So consolidation was not a requirement for this study. Um, some had and some hadn't had consolidation. Okay. So that's the oral azacitidine, not to be confused with the oral decitabine, which has also now been approved. Um, so oral decitabine was approved in combination with a drug called uh, cetaziridine. So the problem with oral decitabine is that it's inactivated by cytosine deaminase in the gut a lot. Um, so by combining the decitabine given orally with 
said as uridine, which is a cytosine deaminase inhibitor, you can enhance the cytobine avail bioavailability. Uh, so this was a study looking at patients with previously untreated and treated um, uh, uh, myelodysplasia, as well as secondary myelodysplasia with uh, intermediate one, intermediate two, as well as high risk uh, international prognostic scoring system groups. This was not actually a randomized trial between the oral and intravenous decitabine. Um, there was actually a crossover, uh, but they basically demonstrated comparable response rates and comparable toxicity. Um, so uh, this would be available, again, as another oral formulation uh, of a previously utilized intravenous uh, medication. Would your thinking be, I've been so impressed with the uh, the DAS of Eneticlax and the seniors with the MDS. So this would be instead of uh, that, you might use this? So um, the FDA approval is only for this use uh, as a single agent. I'm sure there must be studies, uh, perhaps already have been um, combining it with venetoclax mm -hmm. because venetoclax is FDA approved with both decitabine and azacitidine. And right, this could be an oral, oral, oral regimen if it's equivalent, but I don't know that that data is available definitively yet. Okay. And then I was just gonna to touch very quickly on a couple of other new drugs for the sake of time. So our heads don't spin too much. So, um, we had mentioned at uh, one of our last meetings about uh, cabmatinib, which was FDA approved an oral therapy for patients with the um, non-small cell lung cancer with met exon 14 skipping mutation. So there's another drug called tepanitinib, brand name Tepmetco, which was FDA approved with an overall response rate of 43% and a median duration of response of 10.8 months in patients with non-small cell lung cancer with this targetal uh, targetable met exon 14 skipping alteration. Mm -hmm. I don't know that this has been compared head to head with uh, cabmatinib, but it uh, looks relatively comparable in terms of um, efficacy. So another option for and patients with targetable mutation. For yeah, reinforces cancer. all that next gen sequencing to find something if you can. Uh, again, just to mention very briefly, two new approved indications for uh, pralcetinib, a new agent brand name Gavretto, um, for patients who have RET fusion positive non-small cell lung cancer, um, and also for RET fusion positive thyroid cancer. Um, so remember, in addition to checking for our MET exon 14 and all the other things we checked for, for certainly our thyroid cancer patients, but as well as non-small cell lung cancer patients, we now have a drug specifically for RET fusion. And then finally, uh, just to mention a couple of new uh, CAR-T approvals. So Tacartis is the brand name for Brexacaptogene Otolucel, which was uh, now I think the first CAR-T reproved for mantle cells, specifically for relapsed or refractory mantle cell lymphoma. So how this will change the approaches to auto and allo stem cell transplant for these patients is unclear. This is the Zuma 2 trial, um, which showed an overall response rate, very impressive at 87% and a 62% complete remission rate. Um, so that's available. And is it, is it um, mantle cell, Dave, in the specifically mantle cell, right? Okay. So this is specifically a mantle cell approval. Okay. And Liscabdigene Marilusol, uh, which is uh, Brianzi, also got FDA approval, another CAR T for large B cell lymphoma that's relapsed to refractory, um, as well as a high grade B cell lymphoma, primary mediastinal lymphoma, follicular lymphoma grade 3B. So another CD19 directed CAR T. Um, product. So I, I think I will stop there. Um, a lot of new drugs. It obviously will take us all some time to get facile with these. Newer studies I'm sure will be coming out with different sequencing and combinations, but uh, the pace of advance just keeps rolling along. Well, it's really amazing uh, with our part one previously and now part two, uh, 10, 12, 15 drugs with either new indications or new labels altogether. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this and to remind everybody, uh, hard to get it the first time through. So we have show notes at our webpage, mdedge.com slash hematology-oncology. And several of our budding hematology-oncology residents at Pennsylvania Hospital are doing those show notes each week for us. So you've been listening to Dr. David Mincer, our Chief of Hematology-Oncology and Division of Medicine, part Department of Medicine, Pennsylvania Hospital, where he's a clinical professor. Dave, thank you very much once again. Look forward to hearing from you again next year with another 
lineup. Okay, Dave, thank you very much. Blood and Cancer is produced by MD Edge. Our editor is Jen Smith. All MD Edge podcasts are produced by executive editor Kathy Scarbeck, and I'm your host, Dr. David Henry. <laughs>